Okay, so let's, let's take up a second topic here, but just as we do, let's sort of review, okay? Let's look at what we did from last time here. Remember, we took a basic look at skeletal muscle. There's three types of muscle, but we said if we take one of these and look at it in depth, then we can compare the other two to what we're doing here. And we use this image here. This is really a summary of all that we're going to do with skeletal muscle. There's a couple of other pictures we'll use, as you'll see today, too. But this is where we focused. Here's the bone with the muscle attached and the muscle cut through. <clears throat> and coming then out of that whole group of muscle structures there is one muscle fiber. Remember, the muscle fiber is the muscle cell. <clears throat> and this one fiber then we said was very unique. It's got all of the basic parts that every other cell has. It's got ribosomes and nucleus and a cell membrane and mitochondria and all, all the others, but it also has then, and it's filled with these special contracting <clears throat> organelles that we call myofibrils. Um, the myofibrils are the structures that then cause the entire muscle fiber to contract. And when we look closely at the myofibril, we saw that it's made up of lots of little protein threads arranged in a very geometric form to form what we call a sarcomere. And this little area here represents a single sarcomere out of many, many, many sarcomeres over the length of the myofibril. And we pointed out five important components here in the sarcomere. And so essentially the myofibril here is made up of just jillions and jillions of these molecular components. There's a Z-disc, an actin myofilament, a myosin myofilament, a titan filament, and an M-line. Those structural components make up the structure of that sarcomere. And we illustrated the fact that contraction takes place by having these actin molecules pulled by the ends of the myosin. And so these actins are pulled this way, these are pulled this way, and the Z-discs are drawn in, and the sarcomere shortens. And since a myofibril is just many, many, many sarcomeres end to end, they all shorten. And we illustrated that. I had several volunteers and we saw that each sarcomere pulling a little, many sarcomeres then gives a large muscular contraction. And the contraction of any muscle in my human body is this process. And it's just a numbers game. When you have <clears throat> one little sarcomere doing this, but many, many sarcomeres in a myofibril, many, many myofibrils in a muscle fiber, and many muscle fibers in a muscle, <clears throat> you have just, you know, hundreds of billions of sarcomeres each pulling to create a gross muscle contraction. Now, a couple of other things that um, we want to talk about today. We're down to number four. If you've got your outline, your lecture outline that we've been working from, that cream-colored sheet, we're down to point four then. We went through the first three points last week. And point four relates to our ability to see, actually see the contraction as it occurs in muscle. <clears throat> and the contraction could be seen long before we ever knew what was down inside the muscle fibers, long before we knew about anything about actin or myosin. Skeletal muscle is also called sometimes striated muscle <clears throat> because when you put it under the microscope, you can see that there are these long, long fibers, which are actually cells, but the appearance of them under the microscope has this banded appearance. You can see these stripes running through it. And the term striated is just a fancy word for striped. So this, is, this was always called striated muscle. When you look at smooth muscle, you don't see this, which is why they called it smooth muscle, because you don't see any stripes in it. 
So they differentiated different types of muscle early on based on what they looked like under the microscope. So this is striated muscle. What they saw early on was that these stripes changed when the muscle contracted. In other words, if you put some fresh muscle fibers under the microscope and you gave it a weak little electric current, it would stimulate the little muscle fibers to shorten right there under the microscope while you're watching. And what they saw was these bands here would disappear. Rather than having little bands of light and dark and light and dark, the whole thing would crunch up and all of the little light areas would disappear and you just have one big dark muscle fiber. And then when it relaxed again, the bands would appear, the stripes would appear again. And so early on, people knew, hey, these stripes have something to do with it. There's something going on down in there. We don't know what it is yet, we, but there's something going on down in there. And so they label, they gave names to these bands, and that's part of what we want to look at here. If you look at the real thing here from an electron micrograph, you can see where the stripes are, can't you? You see how there's areas here that are very light, and then areas here where things kind of overlap, the myosin and the actin overlap, and things are darker here. There's actually a little bit of a light area right down the middle of this myosin area. But then there's another light and a dark and a light and a dark. And if you kind of squint your eyes so it blurs a little bit, you can, you can clearly see where these stripes come from. Now, of course, this wasn't known at the time. Just <clears throat> a little refresher on what happens here, right? So long ago, scientists observed that the banding patterns changed. Now watch as contraction occurs here, right? Can you see how the width of the lighter areas is beginning to change, right? As the Z disks are drawn toward the center, right? As those Z disks come in, some of these areas where we don't have any overlap are beginning to disappear. See how the amount of overlap increases, and the areas here and the areas here are getting narrower, aren't they? And when this gets to a maximal contraction, see how it completely overlaps, and see how the light areas have basically disappeared. So this is what the people that were researching that saw. Now, what they did was they labeled these bands then. They gave them names because that was all they had to deal with at the time. <clears throat> and it turns out that when we talk about and describe contraction, we still talk about these banded areas. For example, this light area here is called the eye band. <clears throat> this is the, the widest sort and the lightest sort of area. They have less structure, so under the microscope, more light travels through these eye band areas. The darker areas here then would be what are called the A bands. And just a little sidelight, the reason these were called A-bands was because they were the opposite of the I-bands. You know, in Latin, if you want a word to be not that thing, what letter do you put in front of the word? You put an A, right? Or A or an A-N if it starts with a vowel. But so this all had to do with light. So the light bands were a Latin word that starts with I. And then the A-bands were the opposite of that. So they started with the letter A. So the dark bands are the A bands and the light bands are the I bands. So you have this regular, systematic, geometric layout of A bands and I bands. Now there is a third one. It's, it's not a band as such, but notice that there's an area here 
in the middle of the A band that's a little bit lighter because, again, there's no overlap here. The myosin myofilament, remember, is called the thick myofilament, so it lets less light pass through here than passes through here. So this isn't as bright an area as the I band would be, and it's not, we don't think of it truly as a band, so this is known as the H zone, okay? The H zone. Now, be aware, these are not things, okay? These are not structures, right? These are little pieces of geography, right? These are areas, and the areas can change if the boundaries change. And during contraction, boundaries change, and so the areas change. So these can come and go with contraction. The trick is to be able to sort of figure out which ones disappear and which ones don't and make sure that you understand that. It would also be good if you, you recognized it well enough that you could say, okay, what structural components are there in each one of these? <clears throat> For example, let's say, what structural components do you see in the I band? What would you say? If you, if you look at an I band, what structural things do you see there? Which? I see actin. I see part of the actin myofilament here and Z disk. Right. So the actin, myofilament, and the Z-disc occupy that I-band area. What about the A-band? Okay, the myosin there, in fact, isn't the A-band the length of the myosin? Isn't it? Right, the A-band is basically the length. What else is in that A-band? Yeah, and part of the actin, right? So we'd say the myosin and the actin myofilaments are there, and it's really their overlap, you know, that, that creates so much structure there that it becomes a dark sort of area. <clears throat> and then what would you find in the H zone? Yeah, the myosin myofilament is the only one there because the H zone is where the actins end, isn't it? And if we were including, I haven't regularly included, but we could probably include the M line if we wanted to be technical because the M line runs right down the center of that H zone. And if we were including that, we'd probably say that the M line is part of the A band too because the H zone is within the A band. Okay. How are we doing with that? Are we okay with that so far? Now, it's also good for you to note then which one of these, what happens to these bands when contraction occurs? And... Remember, contraction is the movement of these uh, myofilaments past each other, right? They're drawn toward the center. Z-discs come, to, come close together. So which, which one of these areas disappears during contraction? H-zone disappears, right? Because these actins are drawn in in a full contraction so far that they would overlap. What about the I-band? We're going we're gonna to basically say that the I-band disappears. Your book and I disagree on this a little bit. Um, they seem to leave just the tiniest little bit of A-band, or I-band, but they're so little, these myosins really can come all the way over to where they butt their heads against the Z-disc, and essentially they disappear. So... If I ask a question like that, let's assume that both the I-band and the H-zone disappear during contraction, right? And let's watch that occur, right? 
So there it is. They're at a full contraction. See, they'll still show a tiny little bit here, but these things can come right over and essentially, you might see the tiniest little bit, but it's essentially gone in a full contraction. Now, all of this, the pictures I've been using, all of this is summarized here in your textbook. You may want to look back at this image right here. Right? And you can see this is just sort of the four little sequences I was using one after another to illustrate that. Uh, but this, this shows you, actually lays out the A band, I band, and all of that, and gives you a sense of what's going on. Okay, during contraction, would the A band get bigger? Here's the A band here, and there's the A band up there. Does it change its, does the A band change its size? What would be the boundaries of the A band? What would we use to sort of gauge or measure the length of the A band? It's the same length as what structure up here? The myosin myofilament. Does the myosin myofilament change its it doesn't, and so the A-band does not change. A-band is a fixed length because it's basically the length of the myosin. The actin does the overlapping, the actin does the moving. The myosin is just basically there drawing the Z-discs in towards the center. So A-band does not change in any way. But because the others disappear, it then takes up the entire distance here. Okay, so make sure you understand these three. Make sure you can pick out an A-band, an I-band, an H-zone. Make sure you can tell what components are in there. Make sure you know which ones appear and, or disappear during contraction. Okay? All right. Uh, topic number, or item number five on your handout there is the conduction system. And... This relates to conducting the signal, basically getting the nerve signal that's traveling from the brain to the muscle, into the muscle fibers, and causing the muscle fiber to contract. We know that these actin and myosin work to cause the sarcomere to shorten, but what turns them on and off? How do they know when to do their thing? If they're right there next to each other, there must be something that causes them to work or prevents them from working. Because sometimes my muscle fibers are relaxed and sometimes they're contracting. Now, it, it's not time for us to look at the nervous system yet, but if we just briefly think, okay, all of my muscles work in response to messages from my brain, Right, the, Those messages, say, in my upper limb or my lower limb, travel down through the spinal cord. Those messages travel out through nerves, and they finally arrive at the muscles and literally at the muscle fibers. The, the link between the nervous system and the muscular system is right here at the end of a neuron at a place called the neuromuscular junction. And here's a couple of them that you can see right under the microscope. Here's one, two, three muscle fibers. And these little dark structures, these black things that you see here, are the ends of a neuron, a nerve cell that's carrying a message from the nervous system out to the muscle fibers, and this is where the nerve contacts the surface of the muscle fiber. I'm just kind of getting us up to speed on this. We, we don't do, need to do a lot with nerves, but here's the artist's sort of rendition of that. This would, again, be a single nerve cell called a neuron with long tentacles, long fibers that reach from one place in the body to another. And when it comes down to the end, you can see it, it divides into little pieces and attaches itself to a number of muscle fibers. Each one of these round objects here is a muscle fiber. 
and it's been drawn so you can actually see myofibrils, right, within each muscle fiber. You with me? See where we are? Now, what happens at this point? When you get to physiology, you're going to go into a lot of detail here. Okay? Um, some pain relievers work here um, in certain nerves and the point where neurons and muscles come together. There's a whole lot of implications to understanding what goes on here. It's not really, it, it's, it's chemically oriented. The ends of the neuron here releases what's called a neurotransmitter and it's of a specific type that crosses here and stimulates then the surface of the muscle fiber. The neuron does not like reach down inside. It just is laying in contact with the surface and the point where this contacts here is called the neuromuscular junction. And you'll hit that big time, as I said, in physiology. But just in a simple, in explaining in a simple way, there's a neurotransmitter that's released, and that chemical then stimulates a little part of the sarcolemma. Do you remember that word? Sarcolemma, that's the name for the cell membrane of a muscle fiber. There's a special little part of the sarcolemma here that responds to that signal, to that chemical. And then that signal then passes over the surface of the muscle fiber, but ultimately it has to get down into where the actinomyosin is. So how does it do that? Now, the, the first thing that you want to realize um, is that that signal spreads over the surface of the muscle fiber. And by the way, this picture is a little bit later in your, in your chapter, um, chapter 9 here where we're dealing with muscle structure. You can see the sarcolemma has been cut away. I can see the myofibrils here, right? I can even see the little actin and myosin myofilaments, the way they're all arranged geometrically with one another. Right, so I can see a number of myofibrils here. Sarcolemma has been cut away. When that little chemical stimulates the surface, <clears throat> the, the chemical stimuli then spreads over the entire surface of the muscle fiber. Kind of like if you threw, have you ever thrown a rock in a pond? Ever thrown a rock in a pond and it hits? And this still, still surface then begins to ripple, and the ripples spread out from that central point. That's kind of what's happening here. That neurotransmitter hits at this one point, and the signal then spreads over the entire surface. All of the sarcolemma becomes involved. Okay? So imagine it just, you know, it, it kind of, the nerve signal hits at this one point, but it spreads over the entire outer surface of the muscle fiber. Now, what happens next? Well, that signal that's passing over the surface also goes deep within the muscle fiber because the sarcolemma here is folded regularly in regular intervals. It's folded into little tubes that run down through the muscle fiber, and these are called the T-tubules. The letter T here stands for transverse. So the, we, everybody pretty much calls them T-tubules these days, but they've been always known as transverse tubules also. And that's because you can see clearly here, see how they run across? They don't run lengthwise at all. They run right across, and this tubule will be continuous with an opening over here, so the sarcolemma is just, imagine that it's covering the surface of the cell, and then it just, in places, it folds itself down into a tube. And notice how these tubes run all the way around each one of the myofibrils. So it's not like just one tube runs straight across. It comes out, it wraps around, it connects to another tube that's wrapping around. So there's this whole series of tubes surrounding all of the myofibrils. And then there's one here. And regularly spaced one here, there's one here, there's one here. You can see the next holes. So these T-tubules are all along. So 
the signal isn't confined to the surface of the cell. This contracting signal runs deep into the muscle fiber through these transverse tubules. Okay. How we doing? Everybody everybody good with that? So I've got I've got my nerve the nerve signal that hits the surface now is deep within the cell. Now what's happening deep inside the cell? Let's um, let's kind of jump to the next part of this. And the next part is right here. There's a chemical trigger deep within deep within the muscle fiber that triggers the reaction between actin and myosin. And that trigger is called calcium. Now, I, I think this is, this is just so interesting, don't you? When I think of calcium, if you were to think of calcium in the human body, what would be the one thing you'd think of? Bones. You'd think of bones and how it it's basically makes your bones rock-like and hard. Well, guess what? Not only does it do that, but it's the trigger for every muscle contraction in your body. The presence of calcium in the myofibril causes actin and myosin to interact and contract. If the calcium is there, it contracts. If the calcium is not there, it doesn't contract. Simple as that. It's very much like a machine. In fact, all of these little protein things are what many people would refer to today as nanotechnology. You ever heard that term? We've been looking down inside living cells for so long <clears throat> that we've seen that every little protein is like one little piece of a complex machine. And if we could start building our own little molecules, we could maybe assemble little tiny microscopic machines that could be doing things for us deep within human bodies or in the middle of other machines or technical, technological things that we have, electronics and all the rest. So there's a whole field of nanotechnology this, these days that's really built on our understanding of how these little machines work down in our human bodies. So in this myofibril, if calcium is there, it's going to contract. If it isn't there, it isn't. Just like a light switch, on, off. Do it, don't do it. Yeah? Um, it can, yes. It can. There's many links between the nerve signal reaching the muscle and getting right down to where calcium is triggering this. You know, you've got, you've got that neuromuscular junction, Something there could cause spontaneous contractions. Calcium could cause spontaneous contractions. There's many, many different things that could be involved in a muscle spasm or a cramp. Have you ever had a muscle cramp? I remember those like when I was a teenager quite a bit. You know, just, yeah, just your muscles would just all of a sudden just start cramping up. And it was like, what's going on? Well, there's... As you'll see here, there's many, many different things going on between the nerve signal and the actin and myosin doing this. And any one of these could really be a part of that. But calcium can play a significant role here. Okay? So we want to figure, okay, calcium is the trigger. How do I let calcium into and how do I get it out of the myofibrils then? And that's where this structure here called the sarcoplasmic reticulum comes in. The calcium in a skeletal muscle fiber is stored in these structures called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And you can see they're yellow in the picture. The same way the T-tubules completely surround all the myofibrils, this sarcoplasmic reticulum completely surrounds each and every myofibril covering all of them, completely surrounding them. This is where the calcium is stored. Okay? Calcium is stored in these myofibrils. I'm sorry, in these uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. So 
the calcium then can be released from these into the myofibrils or drawn back into these, and it's that movement of calcium that causes the contraction. Okay, so these, these, these are completely around every single... <clears throat> okay, so calcium is stored right here. Okay, and when the calcium then is released and moves into the myofibril, that's where we get the contraction. Now again, when you get to physiology, you're going to go into this big time. You're going to see just exactly how does calcium interact with actin and myosin. There's actually a couple of other proteins that we haven't even named that are part of that actin myofilament <clears throat> that are sensitive, that interact with the calcium to cause the whole contraction. So there's, there's a lot more here than what I'm giving you. But if you go to physiology with this foundation, you're going to be miles ahead and be able to jump right into the more complex parts of what's going on. So the T-tubules are important. The sarcoplasmic reticulum here is important. Now, after the calcium is released and causes the contraction, if you want the muscle to relax, you need to get it back out of there. And that's really the 24-hour-a-day job of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, is taking the calcium back out of the myofibrils. Um, would you say your muscles are contracted and doing something more during the day, or is more of the day spent with your muscles relaxed? Are you, your muscles constantly contracting all day long, or are they relaxed most of the day? They're relaxed most of the day, aren't they? You contract them when you want to do something, but... You know, like sitting here, a lot of your muscles are just kind of relaxed. They're not doing a whole lot. <clears throat> 24 hours a day, the sarcoplasmic reticulum are sucking calcium out. There's no molecular structure. There's no organelle in the muscle fiber that's perfect. Cal little tiny bits of calcium can leak out of these sarcoplasmic reticulum no matter what. So 24 hours a day, this has to be sucking up all of the calcium it can find because any little calcium in here is going to cause a contraction. So sarcoplasmic reticulum are active all day long doing that. And it's really basically just a flood of calcium coming out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that is able to stimulate. Because even as it's flooding out, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is pulling it right back in. It's really sort of a numbers game. You want to have much more calcium going out than the ability of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to pull it back in. So it's, it's uh, you know, picture like a, a laundry room floor and you've got a, a pump there running all the time to suck any little bits of water out of the floor. And every once in a while you throw a bucket in there and the bucket splashes all over. It gets sucked up pretty quickly, but the floor keeps getting wet. Anytime you want a contraction, you flood calcium into there, even though it's going to be immediately pulled right back out. If you want a sustained contraction, if you want to grab something and hold it, then you've got to just keep the floodgates going and keep the calcium pouring into the myofibrils and they will continue to contract. But the moment you, sh you shut off the flood of calcium out, it's going to be drawn right back in. And that's why your muscles immediately relax when you don't want them working. So what? Uh, you can't have too much calcium. Your body very, very closely regulates the amount of calcium. These, these are going to have a certain amount of calcium in them and no more. There's, there's plenty of... Calcium is such an interesting thing. Now you know it's the trigger to all muscle contraction in the human body. You know it's the hardness of your bones. It's the most important buffer in your blood for pH. If you've had some chemistry, you know what pH is. 
pH of the human body has to be maintained at a very constant level. And if you know chemistry a little bit, there are chemicals called buffers that keep things from getting, keep, keeping pH from getting too high or too low. They kind of are like a neutralizer. And calcium is the main neutralizer to pH in your bloodstream. So calcium is the most abundant mineral in your human body. It's everywhere. And it's got very important tasks all over your body. So if your body ever had way too much calcium, what it would do is start storing more in the bones or put, sometimes it'll even get into tendons. You'll start growing bone spurs. I mean, you can, there's a lot of different things that can happen with excess calcium, but it usually doesn't mess up muscles. Nothing produces calcium because calcium is an element, right? So the only way you have cal calcium in your human body is if you eat it, if it comes in through your diet. And you're peeing a little bit of it out every day. No matter what you do, you can't keep every ounce of calcium in your body. So some of it is going to get through your kidneys. Some of it is going to leave your body. So all of us need a certain amount of calcium in our diets every day. Now, as you can see, you know, muscle fibers are the main component of meats, right? So you're going to get calcium in the meat that you eat. You're going to get it in dairy products. You're going to get a number of, of dark green type vegetables have lots of calcium. So there are a number of, re of sources. Uh, a lot of our foods today get fortified with calcium. They put extra amounts in. Orange juice these days, they put calcium into it. So we just we realize that calcium is just really important and it's easy to get deficient. And your muscles won't show it. Your blood won't show it because you've got to maintain pH. You've got to maintain muscle function. So what usually hurts when you don't get enough calcium? Your bones, right? Your body will take it from the reserves in your bones and your bones may get brittle and they might, you know, you might get some osteoporosis at some point. But this moment-by-moment moment muscular activity and the moment-by-moment moment buffering of your blood is 10 times more important than the long-term health of your bones. But if you're careful with calcium, you can, you can get it all taken care of. So I think of it kind of like vacuuming, right? The, the sarcoplasmic reticulum are just constantly vacuuming calcium out of the myofibrils so that they will stay relaxed, so that the actin and the myosin will not interact with one another. And that's the only way to make myofibrils contract. It's, it's just a, like gravity. Okay? If calcium is there, actin and myosin will contract. If calcium is not there, then they won't. And this works even when you're dead. And I'll, I'll show you that because it's a nice sort of summary to what goes on. Let's look at these components again then. If I'm talking about the conduction system, um, what are the structures that are important to know here? Well, there's these T-tubules. What they do is they bring the contracting signal down in from the surface where it was received from the nerves so you ought to be able to identify in a diagram like this the T-tubules. Okay, you should be able to identify the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, let me point out to you too here though, a very important part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When I point to this, you can see that the center of it here all looks kind of um, weavy and network-like, but if you look at the ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you can see they're bigger and thicker and tube-like. That's where most of the calcium is stored. All of this kind of functions as a vacuum cleaner to pull as much calcium out, and the more surface area, the more calcium you can get out of the myofibril. But most of it gets stored in these big, thick, heavy parts that are called the terminal cisterns. Do you know the term cistern at all? A cistern is just a, an older word for a storage tank. Um, I'm always reminded of that if um, some traveling I've done down in the Caribbean, 
Uh, if you're in a main city, they often have water supply facilities. But if you, if you live out in little villages and stuff, um, there usually isn't like pipes in the ground that bring water to your house. Because it rains so much, pretty much what everybody does is they have gutters on their roof. A lot, most of the roofs are like steel, and they have gutters. And when it rains, you just collect it into the gutters. And instead of running out onto the ground, they'll have barrels. Or sometimes people build like a, a big concrete box underground that's called a cistern, right? And you just run the water down into that, and you save it underground in this big box. And then all you need is a little tiny pump and a little tank on the roof of your house that runs down into the pipes, into the toilet or the sink or whatever. And all you have to do is just pump water out from below up into this tank and keep the tank full, and then gravity will push it down into the pipes, into your sinks and stuff like that. So because it rains so much, there's typically a lot of water available and you don't always need uh, um, you know, a city department that supplies water to everybody's house. So these cisterns are the main storage tanks of the sarcoplasmic reticulum for the calcium. And notice something else then. Notice that the T-tubules here, which are bringing the signal down, are right next to these terminal cisterns, aren't they? And they form a threesome there that we call a triad. Okay? So that little threesome where there's a T-tubule and two terminal cisterns on either side of it is called a triad. And this is where the signal jumps from the T-tubule to the terminal cisterns to release the calcium. So this is kind of the final link. We could see how it gets down to the T-tubule. We could see that the calcium is stored here. But how does a sarcoplasmic reticulum know when to release the calcium? Well, it, it's receiving the signal from the T-tubule. And the way that happens, now here's another thing. I talked to you about how the Titan myofilament or the Titan filament was just a recent sort of discovery. Um, I mean, we knew Titan was there, but we didn't know the role that it played. And it's just been recently that our textbooks have had that. This is another very recent one as well. And I've actually seen the electron micrographs of this Here's, here's a triad here. The pink there represents the uh, sarcolemma folding down into a T-tubule. Here's the terminal cisternae, the terminal cisterns here on either side of it. And they're actually, they call them little feet here. I like to think of it as, as arms. Um, it would either be a leg or an arm because it's got a hinge in it. It's got an elbow. And those little things that are labeled feet there are actually holding on to little trap doors. You don't have just little pores here. You actually have little trap doors all along the surface of the terminal cistern. And when the signal comes down that T-tubule, it causes the little molecules that are shaped like an arm to bend their elbow, and they do this. And when they do, they pull these trap doors open, and calcium just comes flooding out of those terminal cisterns. Now, I'm just giving you this level of detail so that it makes sense to you. I'm not going to ask questions at that level of detail. Okay? But you should know then it's, it's the signal that's traveling along the T-tube that causes the little openings on the terminal cisterns, and that's what floods then calcium into the myofibrils to cause contraction. So this is, this is the series of structures that conducts the nerve signal down into the myofibrils and causes the contractions we've talked about. And anything that goes wrong with the contraction of a muscle, a cramp, a spasm, uh, a weakness in it, um, can be anywhere along the sequence. It could be happening at the neuromuscular junction. It could be a problem with the T-tubules and the sarcolemma. It could be a problem with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Anywhere in that sequence of events that gets a nerve signal from the brain to the release of calcium, anything could cause a problem. Sometimes if a muscle gets hit really hard, it will spasm. 
And that's often due to the calcium comes out and the sarcoplasmic reticulum has been damaged and so it can't take up the calcium. And if the calcium stays here, the muscle stays contracted. And that's really all a cramp is, is just a constant muscle contraction that you can't get to relax. That's what it, yeah, it could be that. It could be that you've damaged a nerve and the nerve just keeps firing and shooting a signal in there. So you can't always put your finger exactly on what it is. I know there'd be times when I was a teenager, you know, you're just sitting on the couch watching TV and all of a sudden, ah! you know, you, your muscle just for no reason at all just starts cramping up, you know. So hard to say what's going on. And as, as I mentioned a moment ago, too, this is a mechanical activity that doesn't have to be governed by your brain. If calcium is present, things contract. Um, interesting book, right? What, what are dead bodies used for in our society? You know, does everybody go into the ground? No, lots of people go in, you know, um, safety tests in automobiles often use human bodies. Bodies that are willed to science often go there. Sometimes they, they go out to, um, it's really gross, but there, there are some universities that, want to see what happens to a dead body as they decompose. And so they have these just big fields and they just lay dead bodies under the tree or out in the sun or whatever. And they want to know. Part of it is for forensics. You know, somebody's been, somebody's died and you want to know how long they've been dead. And so there's, um, there's all these different uses for dead bodies. And it's, it's the woman writes very well. But I wanted to point out this, this process called rigor mortis. Have you ever heard of that? Rigor mortis? I think there's even a music group with that name on it or something. Rigor mortis is the, literally the stiffness of death. Um, hours after a human body dies, it typically goes through this process where it becomes stiff as a board. Whatever position, if you put it in some position, you know, and then you're allowed it to go through rigor mortis, it would just be locked into that position. Every muscle in the human body just starts contracting and contracts as hard as it ever did in its life. If you had the body out flat, you could put the head on a chair and the feet on a chair over here, and it would just be straight as a board. How do muscles contract when somebody's hours after somebody has died? Well, <clears throat> basically, the nervous system is the first thing to go, right? The, the tissues that are most sensitive to oxygen in your human body are your nerve tissues. You know that. You know, five minutes without oxygen and you can be gone. A person that is brain dead is no longer present, right? The heart could be going on beating. The, the organs could keep going on. But if there's no brain function, you know, if the nervous tissues have died, then there's nobody home. You and I live, um, you know, the, the part of us that expresses ourselves, who we are, comes out through our nervous system. So when there's no signals, then there's no muscle action, right? Muscles cannot contract if they don't get signals from nerves, or at least you would think that. They certainly can't, um, they can't contract in any coordinated way. Sometimes there will be little residual things going on within the nervous system that may cause muscles to twitch or something, but, but there's no coordinated action at that point. At this point, too, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to have a residual amount of ATP, of cellular energy, and it's going to retain the calcium. It's going to keep vacuuming calcium up. But as it loses its ability to do that, calcium is going to begin to leak from those sarcoplasmic reticula, right? And as it leaks out into the myofibrils, okay, this is just a machine-like activity. And the calcium, as it leaks into the myofibrils, is going to cause actin and myosin to do their thing, okay? And all of the, all of the sarcomeres and all of the myofibrils and all the muscle fibers and all the muscles of the body are going to begin to contract. And they just do that. 
And so the entire, every muscle in the human body begins to contract and stiffen up. It's like gravity. There's nothing you can do about it. It's the way it's built. Calcium is there. It's going to happen. Okay? And it's only, the body does relax then later on, but it's only as the proteins, the actin and the myosin, begin to unravel, they begin to come apart, the body begins to sort of go through a process of decomposition. <clears throat> as that happens, then everything's going to relax again, and the body ultimately does that. But you have this period of time where the body's in this rigor mortis situation. And it, that kind of helps sort of illustrate in one more way how this is occurring. Okay? So, any, any questions about these two points we made? We talked about the banding, A bands, I bands, H zone, and we've talked about the conduction system here. We good with that? How, how long after, did, you know, it, it depends on humidity, it depends on temperature of the atmosphere or the, the, and that's why they do all these tests like in universities to find out, okay, how long does it occur, you know, what are the influences that change that. And those, those like if you're in forensics, if you were a forensic investigator, if you're doing the CSI thing or whatever, you know, you, You've got to take all of those things into account. You've got to go back and look at the weather history over the last you know, week and how much, you know, how much time the body could have spent in the cold or the warmth or whatever. Because this is all chemistry. And the warmer things are, the more rapid chemical activities are. And so you can't just say, oh, it's going to be exactly this amount of time. But you can because it is a regular process, if you know the environmental factors, then you can very closely say, okay, if, if we're this far into rigor mortis, this body has been dead for 12 hours or 15 hours or whatever. But you've, you've got to know what's going on here to understand that. Okay? Good. Any other questions? Good questions. Okay. Okay. 